Welcome everyone. We are glad that you could join us today for our noontime chat on common pest and diseases for spring and summer. For those of you who are not familiar, the 10 Minute University trademark includes short classes, videos, and handouts on essential gardening information for you, the home gardener. Oregon State University owns a trademark and Clackamas County Master Gardeners developed the program. Today's class is the 15th in a series of 21 webinars. With the help of these webinars, we hope to help you master your garden. My co-host today is Laura Iyer, and she will be monitoring the Q&As on uh, the questions on the Q&A. So let's get started. Here is a list of just a few of the publications that are available through the Clackamas County Master Gardeners at cmastergardeners.org. Some of these will help you with today's presentation. And Oregon State University Extension also has many, many publications with so much good information. And here are just a few of them that have to do with today's presentation also. So, I'm going to start today talking about some different diseases and then I will get into the insects after the disease part. So the objectives are for today are to learn the names of some of the common pests and diseases, to know the cause of these pests and diseases, to recognize the symptoms of the pests and diseases, and to learn some management options. We'll also talk a little bit about integrated pest management. Okay, powdery mildew is a fungus that most gardeners will see sometime in their gardening life. And powdery mildew is, can come onto many, many different plants. The cause of powdery mildew is high humidity, warm temperature, and dense plantings. The symptoms that you see on most of the plants with powdery mildew are the tiny, the tiny white powdery spots you see on the leaves and the stems. And then as it progresses, it can cover the entire leaf. Sometimes the leaves will get distorted or wilted or die. That's what we see on most plants. But rhododendrons have a completely different symptom when they have powdery mildew. Instead of the white powdery parts that we usually see, they start off with these leaf spots and then they have a brownish purple spots on the leaf undersides and a purple ring shaped spots on the upper side of the leaves. As you can see, there are many different types of plants that do contract powdery mildew. The management for this is to plant resistant cultivars if they are available and remove infected plant parts, that's if practical. In other words, if you're out there looking at your garden and you see that it's starting, you can remove some of those plant parts and maybe you can help control it. But if it's gotten away from you, that's probably not going to work. Try to avoid dense plantings, so we want more air circulation. Adjust your irrigation practices. Make sure you don't water your plants late in the evening because that moisture is going to stay on the plants, which is going to cause more of the, the fungus to attach to the plants. There are some chemical controls available, and if you do need them, then you'll need to look up the information on your specific plant, and please do follow the recommendations. Now, botrytis is also one of those uh, problems that's found on many, many different types of plant plants. This is a bacteria, and it's caused from cool, wet conditions, which is what we have a lot of time in the springtime. Little air circulation, so you need to make more air circulation for your plants. And once again, just like I mentioned on the powdery mildew, moisture on the plants. Try to make sure that as you go into evening and nighttime that your plants are dry. It might be hard to do that when we're talking about rain, but if you're watering irrigation, that's when you can control that. The symptoms of botrytis can be a lot of different things. Spotting, discoloration, wilting, blossom blight, fruit rots, mold fungus. When you have botrytis on your berries and fruits, you'll usually see this mold like you see on these raspberries. But on other ones, such as that picture that you see of the peony, it just more has the wilting effect. 
So like I say, different plants will have different effects. To manage this botrytis, sanitation is very important because this bacteria overwinters on the plant debris. So make sure that you clean up, clean up all the extra dead plant material that's underneath your, your plants. Space your plants for air circulation. And like I mentioned, avoid overhead watering and late watering. Also avoid excessive nitrogen late in the season. This will cause the plants to put on a little extra growth. And then when our fall rains come, that's not a good sign for the, for the bacteria. Also try to control the weeds because they are also one part of the plant debris that you're going to see down there, which the bacteria can attach to. Now, anthracnose is a fungus that can not only get onto trees, but it can be a problem on vegetables and annuals and perennial plants. But the symptoms and how we deal with them are so different that I'm just going to talk about anthracnose on trees. And usually this is where we see most of the problem anyway, is on the trees. The cause is cool, moist areas with prolonged spring rain. Sometimes we just can't avoid that. It overwinters on the dead twigs and leaves. Do you see it? You see kind of a, a system here where I talk, you need to set, you need sanitation. You need to clean up all those dead plant parts because that's where the fungus and the bacteria will attach to, which will cause it to be, come back to your plants the next, the next year or that same year. The spores are, are dispersed by the wind and the rain. Shade and prior drought problems can favor the development. So, your trees need as much sun as they can get if they're prone to anthracnose. And also, of course, like anything, try to keep them as stress-free as possible. The symptoms for anthracnose are, are kind of neat. They're large, brown, irregular shaped blotches on the leaves. And one way to tell that you have, you know, a lot of leaves have blotches and spots on them, but one way to tell that it's anthracnose is that the blotch will spread down the mid vein. You can see it starting on that one picture there. The blotch will start at the tip and then usually spread down the mid vein of the leaf. Now, if you have the anthracnose on your twigs, you will be see these sunken parts. The twig will be normal and then you'll see like sunken little sunken parts and they will be tanned to brown and they'll have little purple borders around them. And if you have a tree that normally should be losing its leaves in the winter time and the leaves stay on the tree and don't fall off the dead leaves, you'll know that you probably have anthracnose. So plant resistant species and cultivars, if you can find them. Uh, prune out and destroy the infected twigs when they first start. Rake up and destroy any fallen leaves. There's that sanitation again. And I know it says, do not let irrigation wet the tree canopy. You can't avoid that when we're talking about rain but you can avoid that when they're talking about irrigation. If you have an irrigation system that waters your lawn and it happens to hit some of the trees, try to make that irrigation system do it correctly so that it's not hitting the canopy of the trees. And plant your trees for good air circulation. There are some fun fungicides available, but they might not work quite as well for the home gardener. Okay, verticillium wilt is also a fungus. It is a soil borne fungus. And the bad thing is that it lives in the soil. It's there already, these small dark structures called microscolardia, which we cannot even see. Unfortunately, sometimes you just have the unlucky luck of the draw. You happen to plant a plant that is um, susceptible to verticillium wilt in a place that your soil has verticillium wilt. And in order to know whether you do have verticillium in the soil, it takes a very, very detailed soil analysis to find out whether that's what you have. The symptoms can be wilting, chlorosis, stunted or distorted leaves. Usually verticillium starts out with just one side of the tree or one branch may be dead, and then it might take over the, the complete tree. Sometimes, um, if you have just part of the plant with versidolium, well, sometimes a tree can live many, many years after that, even when it does have that fungus in it. Now, if you look at those pictures of the cut pieces of wood, if you have a branch that has died 
and you cut it off and you look at it, you'll see this green or mostly it's usually brown vascular discoloration. And if you cut it straight, it's usually in a C shaped. But you notice if you scrape down the branch, you'll see the brown that's going down, down the branch. And that is your best indication that you have verticillium wilt. So to management, you wanna prune off and burn if you can, or just disregard it, or get rid of any of the affected limbs before the leaves fall. Don't track the soil from an infected area into a clean area. If you know you've got verticillium in this certain area, don't be digging up that dirt and putting it somewhere else because then you're just taking the fungus from that area and putting it to another area. If the tree dies or is removed, you can replace it with a tree that's not susceptible. And Oregon State University Extension has publications that tell you trees that are susceptible to verticillium wilt and trees that are not, and other plants that are not susceptible to verticillium wilt. Uh, the, like I mentioned before, the symptoms vary upon the host. So you'll need to find out which, what you have this tree or this plant and what the symptoms are for that specific one. There is no cure for it once the plant is infected. And it affects more than 350 species of deciduous trees, vegetables, berries, and flowers. So that's a lot of things that you're gonna have to think about. Sooty mold. Sooty mold is a fungus, but it's also an insect. Well, sort of, because it is a pest infestation of the small sucking insects with the piercing mouth parts. If you have these pet, these these sucking insects like aphids, white flies, mealybugs, and scale, you're going to get sooty mold fungus because these insects secrete this sticky substance. And I know you've probably heard of it. It's called honeydew. That's what they excrete, and the honeydew lands on the leaves and that attracts the sooty mold fungus to the leaves. And you can see by this picture that there must have a lot of insects on that tree because a lot of, soot, a lot of honeydew landed on it and a lot of sooty mold adhered to it. Um, the symptom is just this, what you see, the black fungal parts. And it can be on the leaves, the twigs, the branches all over. Okay, to prevent this sooty mold fungus, you're gonna to have to manage the insects. That's why you're gonna to have to be out there looking at your plant. You see that, that's not the problem. The sooty mold is not the problem. The problem is the insects. So figure out what insects you have. Usually the fresh sooty mold that just kind of starts can be washed off with a strong stream of water. Um, and if you have a plant such as a camellia, I get this a lot. I seem to have some sucking insects on my camellia plant. And the leaves on a camellia are so stiff that sometimes if it's just starting, I can take a rag and I can wipe off the leaves. I can wipe the sooty mold off of it. Also, a stream of water will also help you to wash off the honeydew from the plants. The sooty mold will reappear if you don't control those insects. So you need to have control of the insects in order to get rid of the sooty mold. All right, rust. You can find rust again. It's funny, a lot of these diseases are on many different plants and rust is one of them that you can see on a lot of different plants. But luckily it's fairly easy to diagnose because rust looks like rust. So that's easy. If you see what looks like rust, you know what rust looks like, then you can kind of think, okay. And then you can look for a few other things that I'm gonna talk about. But this is a fungus and it overwinters on the diseased leaves and stems. There we go again, does that sound familiar? sanitation once more. It germinates and it affects the stomata and the stomata is the part of the plant that involves that's involved in the exchange of carbon dioxide and water. Wet leaves invite the infection so once again try not to let your leaves be wet uh, later in the evening. Mild humid weather favors the disease development which sometimes we just can't control that. The symptoms are these orange pustules appear on in early spring on both the upper and the lower sides of the leaves. That, that's what looks like the rust. Later, they can enlarge and become really numerous on the underside of the leaf. And then on the top of the leaf, they're kind of molted, molted and chlorotic looking. And if it is on a fruit tree, you will see that the fruit gets very malform, um, malformed fruits on that. Okay, for management, once again, you wanna rake up the dead leaves. Don't leave stuff on the ground. 
prune out the infected and dead wood during the dormant season. If you have it one, if you have it one season during the next winter, try to, to prune out any of that dead wood, get rid of it. Um, remove the infected leaves early in the season if it's possible. And there are fungicides available. So figure out what you have, whether you're talking the fungicide that, <clears throat> excuse me, the fungicide that would be available for your roses is different than the fungicide that would be available for your apples or your pears. So, so you need to know what you have first before you go looking for that. Okay, as you can see, once again, bacterial this bacterial blight can happen on a lot of different species. Um, the cause of this bacteria, it, well, it overwinters on diseased twigs and healthy wood also. Uh, weak or injured plants are predisposed for the disease. Once again, we always say that with any plant, try to keep your plant as healthy as possible. The healthier your plant is, the easier it is for them to combat problems, pest problems, disease problems. Wounds or frost damage or even incorrect soil pH or poor and improper nutrients can encourage the bacteria to come onto your plants. It is spread by wind and rain and insects and tools. So if you do have bacterial blight on something, make sure that you clean your tools in between one plant to another plant. And it favors mild moist weather, which we do have a lot in the springtime that can be, a, can be our weather in the springtime. I have this problem on my lilac tree quite often. And in the next slide, I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, the symptoms are early in the spring, you'll see brown spots on the stems and the leaves and the young shoots. And the young stems, this is what's, what's if you have a plant, like I always know when I have this on my lilac because I go out and look at it and the new young stems, I can see that the tops of them in the flower blossoms have, have wilted and, and they're dying. And then on the older branches, I have noticed that I have a dead spot. I mean, excuse me, I have a live spot with nice green leaves. Then I have a dead spot in the middle, but above that dead spot, I have new growth again. That is a sure sign on a lot of trees and plants that you have bacterial blight. Um, the flower clusters also can be infected, which is sad, especially on the beautiful lilacs. So to manage it, you wanna maintain adequate space between the plants, prune out to prune, prune them. So you got good air circulation. I think that might be a little bit of problem with my lilac right now. I have a few other trees that are getting in the way of having letting it have enough air circulation. I'm gonna have to do something about that. You want to prune out um, all the infected tissues immediately if you see them, get rid of them, cut those parts off. There are resistant species and cultivars of certain plants that you might check that out. And <laughs> this is, I know this is, sounds kind of strange, but in spring, if you could protect them from rain and, and frost by putting plastic hoop and plastics over them, they have found out, it'd be hard to do that on a large tree, but they have found out that doing that is actually better than any chemical treatment that you could find. But that might be kind of hard if your tree is pretty tall. Okay, here's something that every rose grower either has seen or will see, and that is black spot fungus. And black spot is another one of those names that they did a really good job of naming this fungus. Black spots on your roses, you have black spot. This fungus, fungus also overwinters on living and dead plant tissue that was infected the previous growing season. The spores are produced on the old plant material and then they're splashed up by water and rain onto your younger plants. But this is one thing that's really interesting. After a spore lands on the leaf, it's going to take at least nine hours for that leaf to be wet before the spore actually gets into your plant. That is why it usually happens early in the spring when we have our wet weather and when we know that the rain and the water is going to stay on that plant for nine hours or more. And in the summertime, you notice your black spot kind of goes away. If you are watering your roses from the bottom and not letting the water get onto the leaves themselves, you'll notice that you don't have as much black spot because you're not gonna have those nine hours of wetness. The symptoms are some circular, usually circular black spots and they frequently have fringe margins on the leaf. Yellowing and defoliation can, and really susceptible cultivars can happen. 
Sometimes you'll find bare stems and with very few leaves attached to the top. And in wet weather, the spots can become so numerous that you don't have a spotted leaf, you have a completely black leaf. Okay, to manage me, there are cultivars that are known resistant to in our area. And OSU does have some publications on roses. Also Portland Rose Festival will be a good, uh, a good one to look up to find some, some some cultivars that are resistant to your area. You wanna once again, avoid dense plantings and shaded areas. Roses do better in full sun. Avoid the overhead watering, like we talked about. Rake up all the leaves. Don't leave those rose leaves on the ground during after they fall off in the fall. Prune the canes. If they were infected one year, you're gonna have to do a lot of heavy pruning the next year. So prune them back to at least two buds if the canes were infected the previous season. Remove and destroy the disease canes before the buds break, if you, can, if you can tell that that's happening. There are fungicides that can be applied, but they have to be applied a lot. And whatever fungicide you get that's specifically for roses will tell you. It might say you need, a, you need to use it every seven days or every 10 days. Or, so read the label, follow the directions, and it will tell you what to do. Um, it may be difficult to manage it once it gets started. So that's why it's kind of nice. If it's not a very, very special rose to you, you might wanna find one that's resistant to black spot. Hey, apple scab. For those of you that have apples, you've probably seen apple scab or your friends or neighbors have seen apple scab. This is a fungal disease. And once again, it is overwintering on the dead leaves and the fruit and on the ground. So what am I gonna say? Of course, sanitation again clean up all that debris. In the spring, it's, it, it does two things. In the spring, the presence of the moisture forces a discharge of asexual spores, which are called asophores. And then that infection is viable for 10 to 15 days later. They in turn then produce asexual spores, which are called canidia when the weather, when the weather favors it. And then the canidia causes the new fungus, the, asex, the sexual spores again, and it just continues over and over again. It, the symptoms are, are chlorotic water-soaked spots about the size of a pinhead, and then they enlarge and become darker. And they can be any shape, but usually they start out being circular. And on the fruits, you'll see sab scab spots. And they're the small raised black or brown bumps. But as they progress and as the fruit uh, enlarges, the scabs will rupture and you'll see cracks. And they usually, if you do have scab, the one nice thing, I don't know if it's nice or not about scab, but one thing you can say about scab is you can peel the apple and usually the underneath side is okay to eat. So that's good. That's good to know. Okay, to management, there are apples that are resistant to scab. And once again, OSU does have that information. Sanitation, rake up and dispose of the leaves and fruits in the fall and prune for good air circulation. Avoid water on the leaves if possible. And if you have apple scab one season, if you put some dolomite lime, sprinkle it around the bottom of your apple tree in the fall, this will increase the pH which reduces the inoculum for the following season. And once again, there are some fungicides available, but they would need to be put on. The, the hard thing about fungus, putting a fungicide on apple scab tree is most of our trees are so large that the homeowner may not have access to that type of spray material or a sprayer to be able to encompass the whole tree. So now let's talk about some insects, aphids. If you're a gardener, you've either had aphids or you're gonna have aphids. They're small, oval to pear shaped, really soft bodied insects, and they have piercing sucking mouth parts and that's the damage that they do. And their colors can be different. They can be black, green, pink, yellow, mottled, striped, anything. Most aphids tend to match their plant, their plant host in coloration. Sometimes like that picture shows, you might see a dark aphid on a green leaf, but a lot of times you will see green aphids on green leaves and dark aphids on a darker leaf. So you really need to be looking at them and they're normally on the underneath side of the leaf. They, the feeding damage to trees and shrubs and mature plants is usually kind of minor. Um, it's, it's the new, new growth on trees and the new small 
plants that are, that are first growing that aphids can cause the most problem on. When the populations are really high, sometimes the leaf or the shoot can just be distorted. You'll see that picture at the bottom, how those leaves are all curled. The aphids are all inside of that leaf. And a lot of times when that happens, you're not gonna be able to spray it and get those into the inside of the leaves. So you usually just need to cut that part off and destroy it. We talked about honeydew. Aphids do produce the honeydew, which attracts the sooty mold. And some aphids, unfortunately, are vectors of other diseases, and particularly viruses, so it's good to get rid of them. So you can wash off the aphids on the woody plants with a strong stream of water and, and get up underneath because they're usually on the underneath side of the leaves. Don't overdo the nitrogen fertilizer. That's what the aphids love. They love that fresh, new, soft, succulent growth. So don't overdo the nitrogen or you're gonna get too much soft, succulent growth. Try to encourage beneficial insects with insectary plants. Plant a lot of different plants in your landscape. Bring in those good guys to help you control the aphids. And use the pesticide. If you're gonna use a pesticide, use it very carefully and use the least toxic that you can, which insecticidal soap is probably one. Because remember, pesticides not only kill the bad bugs, they can also kill the good bugs. So try to encourage the good bugs into your area so you don't have to use chemicals on them. Excuse me. Okay. I'm sorry, I went too far here. No, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Brown marmorated stink bug is a fairly new pest to our area. It probably came in about 15 years ago. That may not sound very new, but it kind of is in our area. Uh, the brown, they are, the adults are either half an inch to three quarters of an inch long. They're brown on the back and then their abdomen is variable. And you can see the pictures of them there. The immature ones, the babies are a deep red color. And you can see the picture of the small ones there. The thing about the brown mountain stink bugs is their antenna, if you see one, their antenna are dark, but they have these white bands that wrap around them. And they have smooth shoulders smooth shoulders. We have a rough stink bug in our area, which is a predator. He's good. He goes and eats a lot of the bad bugs. The difference between the rough stink bug and the brown marmorated stink bug is that the rough stink bug has the brown antenna, but he does not have the white bands. And he doesn't have smooth shoulders. His shoulders are bumpy. So when you're, when you're finding them, if you see a rough stink bug, don't destroy him. Let him do his job. They, as those of you that have had them around, know that they emit a, a really pungent odor when disturbed or crushed. Terrible. Stinks really bad. They also have the sucking, piercing, sucking mouth parts. The biggest problem with, with brown marmorated stink bugs, if you grow um, food crops, they are a big problem. If you don't grow food crops, your biggest problem is going to be that they are going to overwinter in your house or outbuildings or in other sheltered areas. So that's what a lot of people, when they're calling up to the master gardeners and, and saying they have these stink bugs, it's usually because they're crawling all over their house or getting inside of their house. They attack a wide range of plants, a lot of edible plants, unfortunately. You can see that picture of the apple, both pictures of those apples. Um, the damage is that they stick their mouths inside of the fruit and suck the juices out. And when they do, like that red apple, you can see when you tear back the skin, you can see where they have sucked in there. And the other thing it does is it ruins the fruit because it makes all these bumps and they're very hard. If you tried to cut that bottom apple, there's no way it would be edible. So you need to remove the overwintering insects if you can and monitor for the adults and the nymphs because they both do the damage. If you see a bunch on a tree or a plant, you might be able to use beading trays or sweep nets to collect some of the bugs. If you see them um, just here and there, you can remove them by hand, uh, probably with a glove, into some soapy water. That'll help reduce the populations. They do have pheromone traps that are available commercially, but they aren't really very effective for the home gardener. They are doing some research to attract beneficial parasitic wasp. It's called a samurai wasp. They want to attract this wasp to the area because it will attack the eggs and the nymphs of the brown marmorator stink bug. So they're trying to figure out what types of plants we can grow to bring this wasp in to help control this problem. Azalea lace bugs. 
Uh, here's another pest that's been into our area fairly recently, probably within the ten, last 10 years. Now it's called an azalea lace bug, but it doesn't just attack azaleas. It also attacks rhododendrons, salal, andromeda, and a few other type plants too. Lace bugs are this whitish tan, very lacy looking. They're very small, like a 13th of an inch long. If you ever have a chance to look at an azalea lace bug um, under a microscope, do it. They are amazingly beautiful. They're very destructive, but they are amazingly beautiful. They also have the piercing sucking mouth part. So they, they are sucking the juices out of the plants. The nymphs or the, younger, the youngsters, they resemble the adults, except they're a little bit smaller. The damage that they do is the foliage. You'll have a rhododendron or an azalea. The foliage all of a sudden will start it looking yellow and kind of stippled. And if it's really infected, they'll almost look gray. And then on the underneath side of the leaf, you'll see tar spots, which is the, ex the excrement from the lace bugs, was what they're excreting after, after getting all the sugars and things out of the leaves. Usually you will see this problem around mid-July is when you will start seeing the damage that they've already caused. So you need to catch it before that. So to management, to manage them, Try to maintain the plant as healthy as you can. Stressed plants obviously are more susceptible to the insects. Now here's a nice thing to know. The nymphs hatch in the spring, usually around this time, so in, in April, and they can't fly. So this is the best time to manage them. You can take, a, you can host the plants off with a stream of, of, of really strong water, go up underneath your plants and hose it off. Like I said, the little babies can't fly. So hose off those nymphs, they'll fall to the ground and they won't be able to come back up, at least not very many of them will. If you wait until the middle of the season when the adults are flying around and you try to hose them off, they're just gonna fly away and then come back later. So now is the time to definitely get out there, monitor your plants, see if you have them. The infestations are more severe on plants in the sun than they are plants in the shade because azaleas, rhododendron, salal, they, one of the things they like, areas they like, is more shaded area. There are some resistant varieties of the azaleas out there and rhododendrons also. At my home, I have about 20 or more rhododendrons. They were planted way long time before the azalea lace bug appeared. But I have noticed out of my 20 or so rhododendrons, I have about six of them that the lace bug attacks and the other ones, they don't. Unfortunately, I don't know the names of any of my rhododendrons anymore. So, uh, but I do know that I can go out there and purchase some that they say are resistant varieties, and that's good. The chemical products, if you do use a chemical product, it has to be a contact. In other words, you have to get up there underneath the leaf and it has to contact that insect which is kind of hard to do if you're talking about azalea and, azalea and all those little tiny leaves we have. But if you do need to use the chemicals, please do follow the directions and use the least toxic that, that you have. Vegetable gardeners will probably come across one or both of these in their gardening, um, in your gardening growing season. Fleas and cucumber beetles, flea beetles, not just fleas, flea beetles and cucumber beetles. The flea beetle is a small black, about the size of a pinhead, and it got its name because it dumps like fleas do. The cucumber beetle, there are spotted cucumber beetles and there are striped cucumber beetles. They resemble ladybugs, except that they're more oval shaped and ladybugs are more round shaped. Both of these insects have chewing mouth parts. So they both chew holes in the plants, the leaves and the stems. Now young plants are more susceptible Usually older plants can overcome a few beetles if they're not, if the population is not very high. The problem is that they overwinter as adults in ground, in the ground or in the litter around where you had them the previous season. So you can hand pick them off. At least you can do that with the cucumber beetles. The flea beetles, they jump around too much. You can't really pick them. Crop rotation is important because I might remember I said, they overwinter in the ground sometimes, in the soil. So if you have a cucumber beetle or flea beetles on, on a certain plant in your garden, next year, take that certain plant that you know is susceptible to them and plant it somewhere else. 
Floating row covers will work to keep them from flying into your plant. And that is only if they're in an area that didn't have them the season before. And if they are in the ground coming up, if they're, if they're in that area in the ground and they develop into adults, then you'll just have this nice little area for them to be living in. Sometimes there are crap trap crops, they say, that you can plant to attract these to that crop instead of your good crops. And I think I don't purposely plant trap crops, can't even say that, sorry about that. And I think it's because I always put certain flower, I always put flowers in my garden. I put zinnias and marigolds and other types of flowers in with my vegetable garden. And it seems like my, the cucumber beetles seem to go to those flowers instead of some of my vegetables. So I don't do it on purpose, but I think it does work. Try to encourage the beneficial insects. And that might be part of mine. I have so many different flowers in my gar vegetable garden that a lot of beneficials are coming in there too. Sometimes yellow sticky traps may help. And it's very difficult to control these with chemicals. Okay, geranium or tobacco budworm. It's called either one. Some people call it geranium budworm. Some people call it tobacco budworm. They did a really bad job of naming this because it's not a worm at all. It's a it is a caterpillar. It's a caterpillar of a nocturnal moth, a moth that flies in the evening. The adults are light brown and they have three dark bands across the wings. And I don't know if you can see that picture, if you can all kind of tell those three bands across the, the top wings on that, on that adult um, moth. The larva can be brown, green, or whatever. They have erect hairs and see that picture of the larva? They have a white stripe running along their body. Now the larva, unfortunately, the color can match what they eat. I grow geraniums. And when I have one that's chewing on my red geranium flower, I can see that they're turning red. And the ones that are just chewing on the green leaves usually stay green. The flowers and the leaves and the buds will all show holes from chewing. So you know you have not a worm, but you know you have a caterpillar eating that. You'll also see the black, the small black frass, which is the bud poop. You'll notice those on the leaves. If you see a leaf and it has the bud poop on it, look up above. That's where he's been chewing at and then pooping down onto the, the bottom leaf. Um, the caterpillars will attack the flower buds and the ovaries of your developing flowers and you won't even have all those beautiful flowers. The young ones, the really tiny ones, they'll tunnel into the flower buds before they open, but the larger caterpillars will eat the whole flower and the leaves. So you wanna check your buds, check the flowers for the small holes and for the frass. And if you see the larva, you can remove them by hand, especially if they're larger, just pick them off, uh, throw them in a, a container of soapy water or squish them, something like that. They're most active during dusk in the evening times. So go out there in the evening and really look around your plant. One caterpillar can do a lot of damage. So just removing one will really help your plants a lot. During the daytime, they're harder to see because they're usually hiding underneath the base of the plants. Controlling them with pesticides is very difficult. There is a product called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is an organic product, but it only works on them when they are very, very small. It doesn't work on them when they become larger. Okay, if you grow berries or other soft fruit, you may have come across a spotted wing drosophila. It, this is, say, they say that it is similar to fruit fly. Well, it is a fruit fly. But the difference between the fruit flies that we're used to seeing and the spotted wing drosophila fruit fly is that this fruit fly will attack your fruit as it's on your vine starting to ripen. It is not gonna wait until it is rotten like our common fruit flies do. So they are about two to three millimeters in length, very small. They have red eyes, just like our common one. They're yellowish brown in color. They got its name from the, the male. You see those pictures there that you can tell that the adult male has two black spots on the top of his wings. And the female, you can see that protrusion coming out of the female, that is her ovipositor. She is the one that is going to deposit the egg into your fruits. And the damage that you will see is scarring or spotting on the fruit. You see that, that blueberry, you can see that little 
whole. If you were to take that blueberry and squish it, you might be you might see some of the liquid. They've already liquidified it inside and it would come squeezing out of that hole. So your fruit is usually soft, usually collapses. Sometimes it's, it's all bruised up. And then look at the picture of the strawberry and you can see that little white larva. That is the fruit fly larva that is inside there doing all the damage. So you wanna harvest your fruit in a timely manner. Don't leave it on your vine too long to let it get overripe because that will just increase the population of them. Clean up anything um, hanging or fallen or any of the fruit that you find that is infested with it. Try to clean it up and get rid of it completely. Um, also try to keep your plants healthy, maintain an open aerated plant canopy. There are traps. Um, Oregon State University does have a publication all about how to build a spotted wing drosophila trap. Usually it's just a plastic cup with a lid on it with little holes around the top, 3H, 3 16th inch hole and filled with apple cider vinegar. This way, if you do have the, the, the drosophila, it will be attracted more to the vinegar in your trap than it will be to your plants. And so you put several of them around. Like if you had three or four blueberry plants, you would probably want to put three spotted wing drosophila traps around them. All right, box elder bugs. This is a nuisance pest, a big nuisance. And if I were to ask everybody now how many of them have these on their homes right now, I probably would see everybody's hand go up. I know I do. Okay, they're about a half an inch long, dark in color with red lines going across them. That's a perfect picture of that guy there that you can see. They are a nuisance pest because they cluster on dwellings. You'll find them inside of your home. And the reason they're not a problem for the homeowner is because they eat the seeds of box elder and maple and ash. They are a problem for nurseries that want the seeds to grow more crops. But for a home gardener, they're just a big nuisance. They don't do significant damage, like I mentioned, to your landscape plants. The management that you do is just to get them out of your home or get them off of your home. So you're gonna to have to seal all the entry points. If you have cracks under your windows or under your doors or your screens are not on your windows, that's to, you do that to try to keep them out. You can vacuum them with a, a shop vac. Uh, my husband is out there, he has a large shop and on the south side of the shop always has them. He's always out there vacuuming them up. They've also found that light colored houses have more of a problem than dark colored houses. Don't know why, but they seem to like that. Insecticide for a homeowner to use is rarely justified. Some pest control operators can come and spray your home for them, but I would definitely try all the other things first before you go that route. Okay, sow bugs and pill bugs. This is the last one I'm going to talk about. Sow bugs and pill bugs are a little bit different, but they do the same thing and they look about the same. Now, when I'm, when I'm saying sow bugs and pill bugs, if you were raised in Oregon, you probably called them potato bugs. They roll up into a little ball when you, when you touch them. And as a kid, they were really fun to play with. But if you're from Southern California, it is, they're, they have potato bugs and California, Colorado potato bugs are damaging bugs. They are not our sow bugs and pill bugs, even what we call a potato bug sometimes. These guys are oval bodies. They convex above and flat below. They're about three quarters of an inch long. They have seven pairs of legs. They are actually not an insect at all. They're related to crustaceans instead of being an actual insect, but they're a pill. <laughs> That's why they call them a pill bug, I guess. Um, they have two prominent tail appendages. You can see that in the photo. And they look like kind of like little tiny armadillos and they roll up into a tight ball. They are only deemed guilty by association. Something else caused a problem on your plant, either a disease or maybe a slug chewed on something. Or sometimes you will see underneath a flower pot on your deck, You'll lift it up and you'll see all these sow bugs and pill bugs underneath there and you'll think, oh my gosh, that thing is doing something bad. No, the roots that have come out the bottom have died and they're just cleaning it up. So they just feed on that decaying and damaged plant material. They're not harmful to you, your food, your clothes, your furniture or anything else. You just think they are, but they're actually a good guy. Now, I have just a few more things to talk about. 
And that is that you may have noticed that I did not give a lot of chemical recommendations for management options. They were mostly cultural, physical, and biological. The reason for that is that we would like to have the public learn about and use integrated pest management to deal with their pests. And this is what integrated pest management, or you'll hear it called IPM, means. It is a strategy to prevent and suppress with the minimum impact, the minimum impact on human health, the environment, and non-target organisms, okay? It's a decision-making process that uses regular monitoring, decide if and when treatments are needed to control a pest. Then it uses a variety of tactics to keep the pest numbers low. So these are the principles of integrated pest management. And OSU has a really good publication explaining all about what integrated pest management is. But the, the principles are you first out there, you monitor your plants. You won't know what's going on in your garden unless you're out there looking at them all the time. So go out there, check out those plants. Then you need to identify the pest organism. Was it a disease? Was it an insect? What caused that, that problem with your plant? Or was it neither? Maybe it was just weather. Maybe it was an abiotic problem. Maybe we had a frost. Maybe we had too much sun, something like that. So you identify what the problem was. Then you have to establish an acceptable, acceptable injury level for you, which means I have some roses and yeah, some of them have black spot, not too bad. I'm not gonna enter my roses in a rose um, I'm not gonna enter them anywhere. So I don't mind if they're not looking the best. I just cut them off and put them in a vase in the house. So my injury, my acceptable injury level may be lower than some other people's. They may not want a black spot on their roses at all. And then you need to use all the available strategies you can. So you'll start off with cultural. In other words, your plant selection. Is it, is it resistant to most of the things that, it, that cause it problems? Put the right plant in the right place. Start with a healthy plant and keep it as healthy as you can. Maybe sanitation, cleaning up all that debris underneath. Um, then go to some physical things. Okay, I can hand pick off the insects. I can prune it so it has better air circulation. I can use mulch so the water it has the it has uh, the water doesn't evaporate so easily. Things like that. Using sticky berries. Then you could try some biological. Um, have a diverse plant ecosystem. Protect the beneficials. Don't use a lot of chemicals. If you do have to use chemicals, use the easiest, the least disruptive, and the least toxic. And always, always follow the label that came with the, the chemical that you bought. Now, this picture is why IPM works. If you were out in your garden and you were monitoring your plants and you saw this beetle and you saw this chewed leaf, you would think, oh my gosh, he is chewing on that leaf. But look a little closer. Do you see the brown edges on those chewed marks? That means that that leaf was not chewed on right now. It was chewed on some other time and the leaf is already browning around the edges. So you wouldn't wanna just kill that guy thinking that he did it you would want to find out what he is first. Find out if he's a beneficial or if he is a pest. And if he is a beneficial, you're gonna to wanna to put him back in your garden. And if he's a pest, then you can dispose of him. All right, thank you so much. This is the end of my presentation. Laura Iyer will be here to let us know if any of you had any questions. And if you did, I will do the best I can to answer those questions for you. We have just a little bit of time left. We'll see what questions we have. Hi, Laura. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. It's good to see you. <laughs> Try, I'm trying to see if this to work. Well, you can just talk to me. Um, thank you so much for all your presentation. It was wonderful and your pictures are extravagant. Thank, thank you. you so much. So we have several questions for you. Okay. The first one is, I get clusters of worms on my strawberries. If they are on the ground, how do I get rid of these worms? Okay, first of all, I'm not sure if the person really knows whether they're worm worms. You know, um, the, 
people call caterpillars worms, people call maggots worms. So I'm not sure whether this person actually has worms. Worms do not necessarily eat. They, they're, they're eating other things. They wouldn't be eating the strawberries, not a regular worm. So I'm not exactly sure what that person means by that. So if they went to the metromastergardeners.org, they could <laughs> fill out a form and uh, get a question answered within one or two days. Yes, definitely. And if they have photos, it would be great to be able to send photos in so that we can see what it is they're talking about. That way we'll be able to, like you said, we will be able to figure out what it is. Um, let's see. She has Asian bear, Asian pears, mm -hmm. and she was wondering if she thinks they're being attacked by stink bugs. They stink the fruit yes. and the part becomes hardened, fruit yes. gets deformed. That is exactly what it is. I have Asian pears also, and I do have the stink bugs on mine too. So you need to go through the, the things that I talked about, try to catch them if you can, find them when they're young, get rid of any of them that you can. Um, this presentation will also be online, so you will be able to go back and look at all the management options. And once again, go to Oregon State University Extension and put in brown marmorated stink bug and you'll get a whole publication that tells you how to deal with them. Thank you. I think that you covered this, but one more time, is there anything you can do to get rid of cucumber beetles? Mainly just hand picking them off if you see them and rotating your crops. Definitely rotate your crops to another area. Plant some insectary plants, the kind that we talk about like alyssum and there's a lot of different insectary plants out there that will bring in the beneficials to help control that. Uh, if you can move them to a new area, you could try putting a floating row cover over it so the flying insects will not get onto that. Your, the crop that, that they seem to be bothering the most. Um, some years they're worse than other years. Also, if you can, before you plant your crops, this was not on my list, but before you plant your crops in the, in the spring or early summer, if you're not rototilling your, your garden area up, scuff it up really hard, you know, make a fork and, and try to maybe take a hoe, scuff it all up so that if there is any insects the, they're breeding underneath the ground, which they don't do it for more than like three or five inches, you can bring them up to the surface and hopefully they will pass away. Good answer. Same with slug eggs too. Yes, slug eggs too. <laughs> Does spraying mineral oil help with lace bugs and are there other non-toxic things to spray? I, I am not sure about mineral oil. Um, that's not a listed chemical, correct? Um, insecticidal soap has a little bit of effect. Some people do use neem oil, but the problem is they're underneath the leaves. So you're gonna have to get underneath that leaves and it's gonna have to be a contact. It's gonna have to come in contact with that insect. So for me personally, and I know a lot of other master gardeners do that since we don't want to use the chemical and we're not sure whether we're gonna get it where we want it to do, we just use sprays and spray them when the babies are small, when they can't fly and spray water underneath the plant and try to, to remove them that way. Um, I'd have to look up information on the mineral, but if it's not specifically, if it's not, a chemical has to say specifically that it is to be used on a certain plant for a certain insect. Is that? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this may or may not be covered in the pests and diseases, but maybe some people have this question. I have salal growing at the north side of my mowed lawn. This spring branches were completely dead and brown. What could have caused this? The, the what was completely been? Salal. Okay, oh, the whole thing was dead? Branches are dead. Branches were dead. Mm -hmm. That could have been probably not 
an insect. I do know that azalea lace bugs attack them, but what they usually do is they attack the leaves and they'll become that mottled yellowish color. It could have been from weather, could have been weather related. It could have been drought last year. Uh, did you give it enough water? Is it too much sun? It's on the north side of her lawn. How much sun does it get? Um, because Sal Al needs a little bit of shade. It doesn't do well in full sun. So there could have been a lot of problems. I would definitely just cut out the parts that are dead now. Um, always remove the dead parts and see if you can get new growth. It, Sal Al is an extremely hardy plant. And there may have just been somebody stepped on it or damage, oh. environmental damage that happened. A lot of, lots of things have happened this year. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is another one that may be covered in, within your talk. Her camellia buds uh, come out, but they don't open up. Do you know if that's caused by a pest or, or a disease? I will have to say that I do not know. I would have to look that up. So she goes to um, definitely go to metromastergardeners.org, put in the question, and um, one of us that answers those questions online will be able to give her the correct answer. I am sorry, I don't know for sure why that happens. I know I've seen it happen before, but I don't know why. Okay. Do you, Laura? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I have scale. I don't have that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jane, that's the end of our questions. Oh, wow. If you have any closing comments, otherwise, we can recommend people go to uh, metromastergardeners.org and get some questions answered. How do you? That sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And I want to remind everyone that our session is being recorded and they will be available in the cmastergardeners.org, go to 10 Minute University, then click on videos. And within, within one or two days, Jane's recording will be available for you to see again. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Happy gardening. Mm -hmm.